We were there. We were there all along. And we also built the agricultural base of the American South. In one of the saddest chapters of American history, the agricultural base of the American South was built on the backs and the blood of enslaved Africans and their descendants. It may be noted that the Spanish Inquisition in its own country, as well as Portugal, attempted to eliminate Islam by deportation and forcible baptism. Heavily equipped with firearms, the Portuguese, upon entering Africa, killed Islamic natives of that country and erected the Christian cross in mosques and other places of worship. Then they began to capture helpless victims who were unable to fight. The standard procedure was to take unsuspecting innocent human beings into captivity as a commodity to be sold in Europe and wherever the market demand existed. Islam influenced all of West Africa and regions south of the Sahara for more than 800 years. Thus, the spread of Islam throughout the Americas was ironically due to the oppressor's use of barbaric methods of enslaving a massive workforce in order to colonize the New World. Of the approximately 20 million enslaved Africans that were brought to the Americas, approximately 20 to 30 percent were Muslims. It is also estimated that at least 30 percent of the slaves were Muslims, and that's not counting the millions who died en route. During the voyage, guards and masters inspected their money-making cargo for quality control. Those slaves who did not pass the inspection due to poor health or broken limbs were thrown into the ocean alive as if they were useless and devalued. The educated and learned people of Africa had become slaves in America. It was a great tragedy that these people, being the bearers of the most enlightened civilization of its time through Islam, were reduced to slavery by the European. And many of these four to six million enslaved Muslims were highly educated. Many of them were scholars and imams, and at least one was a Sharif, a direct lineal descendant of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The trading companies were unaware of the depth of Islamic belief among the African people. They only viewed their spiritual traditions as mere indoctrination that came as a result of centuries of Islamic exposure. The colonists did not realize that these noble people had Islam in their hearts and minds. Ignorant of the validity of God's messenger, the Europeans simply regarded the Islamic culture and beliefs as if they were only an intrinsic characteristic of the African sociological system. They captured respected intellectuals, public officials, religious and political leaders, heads of families, innocent children, mothers, girls, and whoever they could lay their hands upon. In my book, Muslims in American History, I present 27 brief biographies of these enslaved Muslims in America. Let me share just a couple of them with you. The first concerns Yaro Maumont. He was born in Africa around 1686 to 1707. Sources differ as to when he was actually born. He was enslaved and arrived in Maryland sometime around the year 1731, where he was purchased by the Bell family and put to work making bricks. Apparently, after building a brick home for the Bells, the Bells did something that was most unusual in the American South. They freed Yaro Mahmoud. This did not happen very often. But given his freedom, Yaro Mahmoud continued to live in the area around what is today Washington, D.C. Yaro was a slave of the Bell family in Georgetown and was finally freed because of his piety, integrity, and hard work. Yarrow, as a free man, lived to be 100 years old when this portrait was painted. He owned his own house, and he would walk on the street singing loudly in praise of Allah. He was modestly dressed and observed the Islamic dietary rules. He did not drink alcohol or eat pork. He successfully maintained his identity as a Muslim in spite of the pressures upon him from the Christian masters to convert to Christianity. No matter where he was, whether it was on the street corner or in the middle of the street even, he would immediately stop 
and perform his prayer. Perhaps more famous though was Kunte Kinte. Kunte Kinte was a member of the Mandinka tribe of West Africa. He was born around 1750 in Jafur, a village along the Gambia River in West Africa. He was educated in Quran and Arabic as a child in the local village school. At age 16, Kante left the village to go out into the jungle to find some wood to make a drum. And at that point, he was captured by slave traders, taken to the coast, and transported to America on the Lord Ligonier. He arrived in Annapolis, Maryland on September 29, 1767. There is no God but Allah. Kante, however, was a proud person and he didn't take to slavery very easily. And he repeatedly attempted to escape, being caught each time. Finally, after his last attempt to escape, in order to keep him from running away again, his owner amputated his foot. He later married and fathered one child, a daughter, Kizzy. We know that Kunte Kinte continued his prayers throughout slavery and that he taught the basics of Islam to his daughter. However, his daughter was then sold away to another slave owner and was raped by that new slave owner, giving birth to a son who's known as Chicken George. Photos of Chicken George taken late in his life as an old man show him wearing a thobe the Islam of Kunte Kinte, despite the horrors and hardships of slavery, had managed to survive to his grandson. Uh, Ibrahim Abdul Rahman uh, was a slave in uh, Mississippi whose history got recorded uh, at the time, um, but it got recorded for very special reasons. Uh, Ibrahim Abdul Rahman was a prince from a West African kingdom. And the way the story goes, as a young man, he was a colonel in his father's cavalry. His father was the king. And uh, a Scottish physician, who was the ship's physician on a British ship that had docked on the West African coast, decided to go for a walk. And he got lost and traveled way inland and was found half dead by uh, the people of Ibrahim Abdul Rahman. And uh, he was nursed back to health and stayed with that uh, tribe for some time and then announced his intention that he wanted to, to go back to England. And the king uh, sent uh, soldiers to accompany him to the coast and provided him with gold so that he could uh, return to England. Some years later, Ibrahim Abdul Rahman was captured by slave traders and sent to the Americas and uh, was enslaved in the area around Natchez, Mississippi. Um, and he was in slavery for, for years and years and years until he was an old elderly man. He had managed to, to work his way up the slave hierarchy to the point where he was allowed to have his own little vegetable garden. And he would uh, grow vegetables in this vegetable garden and he was allowed uh, on Sundays to, to go into uh, Natchez, Mississippi and sell his vegetables so that he could have just a, a little bit uh, of money to his own name. This, this was unusual, but uh, uh, alhamdulillah, it happened for him. And as he's on the street uh, there in Natchez, Mississippi with his cart of vegetables, he sees a white man riding a horse down the street. And you have to remember that Ibrahim Abdul Rahman had been a professional cavalry officer in his father's army. And from the way the person rode the horse, he recognized the Scottish physician that he hadn't seen in 40 years. Well, the Scottish physician dismounted, came over to look at the vegetables, and recognized Ibrahim Abdul Rahman and immediately embraced it. Now, you have to put yourself in the mindset of the early 19th century in Natchez, Mississippi. Here's a white man embracing an African slave publicly on the street. Well, the story got around that this guy was a prince. 
And so a newspaper editor came and interviewed him and, and wrote some stories about him and uh, suggested that Ibrahim Abdul Rahman write a letter back to his family in West Africa uh, asking for their help in securing his freedom. And the newspaper editor promised he would uh, take care of mailing it. And that did happen eventually. And uh, because the United States at that time only had uh, diplomatic relations with Morocco, the, the letter went to the uh, uh, royal family of Morocco. Fortunately, they knew Ibrahim Abdul Rahman's family. And so they immediately began pressuring the United States to release Ibrahim Abdul Rahman. May 15th, 1828. Abdul Rahman is a Moor who has been 40 years a slave in this country. The Emperor of Morocco expressed a wish that this man might be emancipated and sent home. I should like to oblige the Emperor. And then Ibrahim Abdul Rahman made a long journey from Mississippi to the eastern seaboard in which he lectured to raise money to buy the freedom of his children and grandchildren that were still in slavery in Mississippi. And Ibrahim Abdul Rahman had undergone a public conversion to Christianity. And uh, one of the things that he would do was he was to raise money was to tell people that he was going to go back to Africa and be a missionary and, and convert uh, you know, the Muslims to Christianity. Well, at one stop in Philadelphia, a minister came up to him, a Christian minister, and asked him to write the Lord's Prayer in his own language. And uh, Ibrahim Abdul Rahman granted the request and, and wrote, uh, wrote it. That, uh, that piece of paper still exists. And uh, it's a very interesting piece of paper because uh, the writing is Arabic and what was written wasn't exactly the Christian Lord's Prayer. It was al Fatiha. So, you know, we, we have another case of, a, of an enslaved African who underwent a sham conversion of Christianity. For years, small county museums in the American South had what they thought was sort of magical scribbling done by some African slaves centuries ago. In the last half century, scholars have been have started going into these small museums and looking at what's there. And what they have found is entire Qurans written in Arabic from memory by these slaves. Entire books of fiqh written from memory in Arabic by these slaves. Some historians are now estimating that the percentage of literacy amongst the slaves was actually higher than the percentage of literacy among the slave owners. It's just that the slaves' literacy was in Arabic and the slave owners was in English. This corner of the exhibition is really interesting because you've got real evidence of this link between Islam and slavery. Research here suggests the number of Muslim slaves was much greater than previously thought. One third of all of the enslaved Africans that were brought to the Americas actually were Muslims. Nobody knows this. This is kind of new cutting edge information because when we read our history books, we don't see that. <laughs>